Good morning, all of you. Thanks for coming. I mean, thanks for coming today uh, to this session number 726 and poetically titled uh, Farming Under the Crescent Moon Archaeological Insights into the Medieval Islamic Green Revolution. My name is Marcos Garcia. I'm from the University of Granada and I'm organizing this session with my colleagues, uh, Jérôme Ross from the National Museum of Natural History of Paris and Michelle Alexander from the uh, University of York, who is in maternity leave and is able to join us today. In this introductory talk, we would like to present some general ideas uh, concerning the central topic of this session. Many of the papers that will be presented cover the points that we want to make, but uh, we wanted to begin from a broad, from a theoretical perspective of the, uh, concerning the analysis of uh, animal and plant husbandry in the medieval Islamic world. And the first idea we want to make is that when we think about husbandry, we refer to a complex phenomenon. As we all know, plant and animal husbandry uh, represent two of the main components of almost any agrarian system from the Neolithic period onwards, so their economic importance is without doubt. But there's another factor that we also forget, or usually is forgotten, that is the social factors implied in these activities. In our view, the economic and the social significance of uh, husbandry cannot be disentangled. And this is because farming is, above all, the production of food. For this reason, we suggest that the study of, uh, of husbandry has to be combined with the analysis, with the study of food waste in the past. People that not eat anything, not even what is best for us, so, as Michael Deidler stated in this, in this quote, diet goes beyond any biological or abel biological need. So, when dealing with the study of farming, we have to pay attention to this other side of the coin, particularly because consumption and the demand that makes it possible determines what vegetal and what animal species humans grow and breed. Arguably, in the case of the medieval uh, Islamic medieval food waste, this phenomenon is more relevant to animal husbandry than to uh, vegetal uh, the plant production and the consumption of vegetal food items. As none of the papers that will be presented today deals with the management of livestock, the livestock management in the Muslim medieval world, I'd like to present in a very summarized way a key or a, a case study from my PhD thesis that illustrates, I think, that it illustrates the close relationship between the spheres of food consumption and production. For this study, we analyzed the faunal remains from uh, a number of sites in southern Iberia with chronologies between the 7th and the 12th centuries. Among other results, we observed a correlation between the frequency of pig remains and the biometry of two species, of chicken and sheep. In those cases where the evidence suggested local breeding and consumption of pork, the, uh, these two species, the chicken and sheep, tended to be smaller in size than in cases where pig remains were absent. Given that higher meat yield is correlated with uh, larger bones, it seems plausible to link <clears throat> the increased size of these animals with their um, improved meat yield. As this trend correlates also well with the uh, dramatic disappearance of pig remains in the zooarchaeological record, this pattern is interpreted as being the result of a process of intensification of these two animals during the uh, Islamic Iberia. In this sense, intensification refers to the uh, management of chicken and sheep with the aim of increasing the quantity of food that they could provide. As a consequence, in my opinion, of the Islamization of, of Iberia. And 
uh, to the spread of the code of behavior that formed the Islamic orthopraxy, this, the orthopraxy of medieval Islam. This case of the study reflects the complexity of agrarian systems that are comprised by uh, multiple interacting factors. So one change in the system caused the need to adjust the other elements of the system in order to find a new equilibrium. In this case, new sorts of animal protein to substitute those derived from pork. Economic reasoning is therefore not the only variable to take in mind, to bear in mind, when we uh, study a husband during the past. Other aspects, such as the social factors, are equally relevant for the comprehension of why, why and how people bred their animals and grow their crops. In other words, why and how people produce food in the past. Our second point we want to make is more closely related to the title of this talk. It also makes sense in the, in the, the framework of this session. Our knowledge of farming systems in the Islamic medieval world has been built as any scientific endeavor by the or on the efforts of countless scholars. In this sense, the uh, contribution of Andrew Watson has to be highlighted. He since uh, as he was the first who proposed that the early medieval spread of Islam was followed by the, uh, followed by the fashion of a new package of plants of intensive methods of farming, particularly irrigation technology, and uh, a subsequent rise in crop production, referring to this process as the Arab agricultural revolution. The value of Watson's contributions is of paramount uh, relevance, given the profound implications that they hold for the uh, comprehension, for, for our understanding of the, um, the medieval husbandry in a general sense, but also because uh, the influence and the impact of its thesis. In this graph, in which uh, here on the bottom, in which the number of citations of his first and most influential article on this topic, published in 1974, gives a crude but a very illustrative uh, measure of its impact, and also showing a surge of citations in recent years. We will not review here the criticisms of the whole, uh, the whole of Watson's thesis, given that uh, the main uh, elements are well known. Instead, we'll focus on two elements that have been much debated or plainly rejected by other scholars. The first refers to the nature of innovation. It has been claimed that the impact of the medieval Arab expansion on agriculture was a complex phenomenon that took place over a longer period than uh, the concept revolution implies. The chronology and the scope of Watson's proposed changes have been demonstrated to be problematic given the growing body of evidence for pre-Islamic uh, diffusion of techniques, tools, and cultigens in the Near East and the Mediterranean. Indeed, Watson's th thesis was not based on archaeological uh, evidence. Marijke van der Wien correctly underlines the fact that agricultural innovations are concerned less with invention and adoption and more with uh, change and adaptation. And this is an assertion that has been widely accepted by other authors that undermines the possibility of radical changes in the uh, agrarian past, the pre-modern agrarian past. This led us to a second issue, namely the concept of agricultural change and the agents implied. Concerning the, this topic, somewhat overlooked by Watson, we have to highlight the work carried out in the Iberian Peninsula by Thomas Glick, and particularly the development of an original methodology known as hydraulic archaeology by Michel Barcelo and his team, based it at the, uh, the Autonomous uh, University of Barcelona. This line of archaeological inquiry is based on the grounds that the key element for understanding the Islamic society of Al-Andalus 
or peasant groups, peasant communities, considered as the main actors responsible for the agricultural change. One of the most significant contributions of Barcelos uh, team is the global perspective of, of social analysis that they adopted and the critical importance assigned to the social structure responsible for the management of the uh, irrigated systems. In our view, this social perspective represents a valuable insight into the understanding of how husbandry systems are linked with socialist structures. In this sense, agricultural practices are conceived as social options that reflect political decisions. Peasant agency, therefore, plays the key role in the design and exploitation of any husbandry system. But peasants, as social agents, do not live in an historical vacuum. As Barcelona stated, agriculture doesn't exist. What exists are peasant work processes more or less dominated by external forces, like external political forces. Hence, as we have said before, if agriculture is eminently the production of food, we we'll have to pay attention not only to the sphere of production, but also to the patterns of processing, storage, preparation, and consumption of this particular type of material culture that food represents. And rather paradoxically, the study of irrigation system has not been always fully connected with the analysis of these issues, limiting the global and systemic comprehension of historical agroecosystems. Precisely, the contribution of bio, uh, bioarchaeology and geoarchaeology helps or allows to fill the gap between the study of the agrarian areas of production and the places where produced items were processed, preserved, stored, consumed, and redistributed. Scientific advances are only possible when significant and representative knowledge from particular studies have been acquired, has been discussed, and shared. Particularly, especially when paradigmatic views of the past are so well established as Watson's uh, agricultural revolution model. And this is the aim of this session, to bring together new archaeological evidence uh, related to the consequences of the medieval Islamic conquest on farming regions. The eight papers that uh, will be presented in this session have been arranged in a geographical order, from the east to the west. So we'll move from Afghanistan, <coughs> sorry, for, from Uzbekistan to the Iberian Peninsula, to Iberia, via uh, the Near East and Sicily. We have planned two discussion slots that will be led by Jérôme Ross. The first focus on the first, on the seven first papers, before a break at seven, uh, sorry, at uh, 10.30, and a second one, the last one, on the remaining two papers and for general discussion. And it will be not only 15 minutes, the last discussion slot, I mean, but maybe we can uh, have it for a longer period, for a longer time. So thanks for your attention. Thanks for coming today. Thanks for presenting your answers and to present in this session. We hope that it, uh, it will be uh, fruitful and interesting for all of us. And it's my pleasure, without any uh, interruption, without any break, to introduce the first speaker, is Robert Spengler from the Max Planck Institute for the science and human history, and who will present the paper Archaeobotanical Studies at the Tashbulak Archaeological Site during the Karajanic period. Thank you.